now is my pleasure to present to you another great Virginia leader, our Attorney General, the Honorable Ken Cuccinelli. Good morning. It is a distinct pleasure to be with you all today, especially on such a gorgeous day. Recently, a friend of mine relayed to me a true story of his from college where he was in a fraternity and uh, announced that he was going to start a Bible study and they were going to meet in the dining room of the fraternity and uh, that any of the pledges or brothers were welcome to join him. Well, an annoyed faction within the fraternity uh, objected, confidently protesting that this most certainly offends not only the fraternity's bylaws, but the university tolerance policy and obviously the very essence of the U.S. Constitution. This is a flagrant violation of the separation of church and state, these 21-year-old legal scholars confidently declared. The story illustrates the massive and culturally pervasive confusion surrounding the constitutional expression of faith and worship and serves as a fitting reminder of something wonderful that took place 225 years ago, approximately four blocks away from this very location in the old capital. This 200-year-old one is the new capital. In the old capital, in that building, the Virginia General Assembly adopted a bill called an Act for Establishing Religious Freedom. From the time that bill was first drafted in 1779 until seven years later when it finally passed in 1786, the author, Thomas Jefferson, labored alongside his companion, James Madison, for seven years to get the bill passed. And what was it for? Jefferson and Madison wanted to ensure that Virginians would not be coerced to either worship or finance worship, nor be prevented from engaging in the same. This was considered settled law until the mid 20th century in this country. Even as late as the 1940s, the Supreme Court consistently recognized Jefferson and Madison's warning that we shouldn't make a man worship or inhibit his worship. In the latter half of the last century, the 20th century, however, many judges increasingly decided that they liked the part about not coercing worship, but they were not always comfortable with the public expression of that worship and thought that this public expression needed to be trimmed back. In other words, some judges began to break away from the historical role of interpreting the Constitution's settled law and trended toward crafting their own legal theories. They did this by tinkering with an important part of the First Amendment called the Establishment Clause, which reads, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. Unfortunately, judges in the latter 20th century moved away from grounding their legal theory in history, in historical fact, and instead favored judge-made abstractions that have tended to drive religion out of the public square. Perhaps there are some observing today's assembly who will think that today's gathering is somehow illegitimate, if not outright unconstitutional, but any such notion is based on a complete misunderstanding of our history and our founding. These people have to reconcile themselves to the very practices of the Founding Fathers. The Congress that passed the First Amendment employed, paid chaplains for both the House and the Senate, and immediately after enacting the First Amendment's Establishment Clause, asked President George Washington to declare a national day of prayer and thanksgiving, and President Washington happily obliged. What then should we make of Jefferson's wall of separation between church and state, which some liberal judges reference as justification for trimming the public expression of faith and worship? Here's what you need to know. Like many churches and organizations of the day, the Connecticut Baptist Association sent a letter of congratulations to the new president, Thomas Jefferson. The president politely replied with a note of thanks and goodwill and included a brief commentary on the Constitution, saying that the effect of the Establishment Clause 
was to erect a wall of separation between church and state. But before concluding what bearing Jefferson's letter has on the propriety of voluntary prayer in the Capitol, we need to know the rest of the story. The rest of the story is that Jefferson wrote this letter to the Connecticut Baptist Association on a Saturday, and the next day he took his Bible and walked to the non-denominational church service in the house chamber of the Capitol in the House chamber. So we can assume that if President Thomas Jefferson were alive and with us today, he would smile with approval at today's constitutionally sound and legitimate assembly to seek God's blessing and guidance. And I would note historically that Thomas Jefferson was probably one of, and I don't mean this derogatorily to Thomas Jefferson, but to raise up his fellows, he was one of the least faith-focused founding fathers among all of them. That was the bottom rung in that day and age. If only it were the bottom rung of elevating faith today. Today, the wisdom of the founding fathers reminds us that they founded this nation as one nation under God. And when they wrote the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, they really meant what they wrote. So let's take them at their word. Thank you, and may God continue to bless and save this great commonwealth. God bless you.